Hey guys, Quiv the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel and today we're going to talk about solar astronomy, solar astrophotography. Now if you've seen my channel before you may know that I have bought this solar telescope um, a few weeks ago and that I am, I am completely amazed and, and truly impressed by it. It's such a lot of fun. And so I wanted to make this video about like what, uh, how to get started really in solar astronomy, solar astrophotography when you know you, you've never done it before. because I think it's a great part of the hobby. Um, it's a, the sun is a target that is ever changing. There's always something new. And for me in Tokyo, it's in summer very often I'll get very clear days like I have right now and then cloudy nights, which is what I'll get tonight according to the forecast. And so being able to maximize my enjoyment, the, the time I can spend with the hobby is like what solar astrophotography and astronomy is all about. And it is absolutely amazing. It is truly impressive once your eyes get used to like that H alpha look of the sun. And I'll get to that in a moment. Now there are basically multiple ways you can do um, solar astronomy and astrophotography. It's uh, the simplest way and the cheapest way if you already have a telescope or a pair of binoculars um, or eyes. Um, is to use like if you have eyes solar glasses like eclipse kind of uh, glasses never use standard sunglasses or you know home homemade kind of stuff unless you know exactly what you're doing uh, you really want to use like proper solar um, gla glasses to view the sun with the naked eye or you can also use like solar filters that you can put on the aperture like on the front lens on the whole of front front lens of your telescope and those call, those are called white light filters you can put them on the front end front uh, objective of your uh, binoculars you can put them on the front objective of your max stuff telescope of your refracting telescope of your schmidt cassegrain of your newtonian it all works as long as you cover the whole aperture at the front the whole um, objective and once you have that, you can view the sun in white light, which can be quite awesome because you can see the sunspots, you can see eclipses. Uh, but really, what I think is what really fun is, is when you look at the sun in H alpha. Now, just to be clear, H alpha for solar viewing and H alpha for uh, deep sky imaging of nebulae, which you've seen me do, do before, are two completely different things. Um, and you cannot use an H alpha filter for nighttime imaging and also for solar imaging. They're completely different and they're separate and you should never mix both together and you should never look at the sun directly without the proper solar protection. Now H alpha uh, astrophotography and astronomy of the sun is amazing. I, ke I keep saying it's awesome. There's two ways to get into it. There is uh, a dedicated solar telescope like this one or like recently the, uh, the the later version of this one called the solar max 3 this is a solar max 2 i'll be leaving links by the way in the description uh, affiliate links to opt um, if you want to buy any of that stuff um, but this the, the later version you can remove completely the solar filter and use it as a normal nighttime telescope as well as far as i understand not completely sure this version you cannot so it's a dedicated solar telescope or if you have a refractor, if you have a refracting telescope, uh, you can use something called the, uh, the Daystar Quark, uh, which is basically kind of an eyepiece that you put in your eyepiece holder and you power it via USB and you can tune it to see the sun, the sun details very well. And it takes a bit of time to tune and it takes a bit of time to stabilize and you need external power, but it is much cheaper than a dedicated solar telescope. Now, H alpha in the sun in H alpha, you'll be able to see prominences, those huge eruptions that are many times the size of the Earth that are like spewing out of the sun. You'll be able to see the solar surface details, like those filaments, like those flows of plasma that are flowing out of in or whatever they do. Um, sunspots. I, I'm not familiar with the physics. I just see, think it's completely amazing. And uh, you'll be able to see all of those details. It does require to get a bit used to it because it, it can feel low contrast at first. But I'll talk about some tips and tricks for the observation and for the imaging as well. Um, okay, and so the quark eyepieces, uh, you need the quark eyepiece, 
you need a refracting telescope that's air spaced like most refracting telescopes and you'll also want uh, ideally a uv slash ir cut filter also known as a luminance filter that uh, will be at the front of your star diagonal so if you have a, a diagonal like this one at the back of your refracted telescope which you usually have for visual observing you'll want at the front so be, so not at your eye level but like uh, in between the diagonal and the telescope you want to screw in a luminance filter and that will help dissipate or block the heat from that concentra concentrated ray of sunlight so the heat doesn't crack the mirror of your diagonal and then it gets into the quark eyepiece which is an eyepiece that's there and then it gets into your eye and it is properly filtered out i used to have a quark chromosphere eyepiece which i highly recommend over the prominence um, eyepiece because the, the chromosphere eyepiece can view the solar surface details but also the prominences with no issues uh, and i used it with a 107 millimeter aperture um, sharp star apo telescope it was amazing i loved it it's not quite as good as this but man was it good and you know if you have a refractor and you want to do like daytime astrophotography astronomy and you have the means to do that like get a quark chromosphere it is amazing and again i'll leave links in the description below i can highly recommend those i love them um, and solar telescope works as well i love the fact that it is a double stack telescope uh, meaning I have one filter here and a second filter here in the middle of the telescope and that means I have a very tight band pass and I can see more details than I could even with the chromosphere, uh, the quark chromosphere. But, you know, this is much more expensive. If uh, you have a refractor already, I would really go for the quark. If you don't have a refractor, this can actually make sense. So how does this all work? How do you get started? So once you have your quark chromosphere in your telescope, you'll want to point to the sun. And the problem with pointing to the sun is that you cannot use a standard finder because if your, I mean, your, your normal finder, you should actually keep it obstructed. If you have a, a visual finder that's like a, a small telescope in and of itself, or if you have a guide scope attached to your refractor, make sure it is covered while it is pointed to the sun. I did an experiment. I left my guide scope open and then I put a sheet of paper behind it and the paper burst into flames, which is not what you want to happen to your face while you're trying to center the sun in your eyepiece not recommended uh, so seriously be very careful and uh, some of the bigger telescopes refractor telescopes if they're not dedicated solar telescopes they might need a full front energy rejection filters that might be a bit more expensive uh, i heard i read it seems the, the recommendations kind of changed but i read that up to 120 millimeters you can use uh, aperture you can use the uh, quark eyepiece without an energy rejection fil rejection filter and i did not have an, an erf energy rejection filter with my 107 millimeters meter sharp star APO that I use with the quark and man how awesome it, it, they are so okay you have the telescope you attach it to a mount it can be a go-to mount like this one it can be a fully manual mode mount and that's I loved actually using manual mounts and now you need to center the sun you can buy specific finders solar finders that are made to center the sun without even you know doing anything and actually I have one that's a bit hidden that can help me do that but there's a, a very simple technique as well which is using the shadow of your telescope so let's do that together okay so you can see here the shadow of my telescope and you can see here the shadow of my mount and basically the goal is to make the shadows especially the the telescope shadow as small as possible it works when it's on the wall like that it works when it's on the ground as well uh, the angle the relative angle of the shadow to the ground might make a bit make it a bit more difficult but it is all eminently doable so you know if i slew the telescope in one on one side you can see this shadow gets more extended the eyepiece gets the eyepiece shadow that's here gets all out of whack and i know that i will not be pointing to the sun in that case right so now again i am not pointing to the, the sun and if i do it in declination as well so in altitude as well you can see the shadow of my telescope gets more and more elongated so we are not pointing at the sun at all so i want to first use the altitude with the altitude i'll make it as small as possible as it is right now and then with the uh, azimuth 
I can again try to make it as small as possible. And my eyepiece actually for me will play a big role because I want it to be centered in the middle of my telescope shadow, which is roughly here, right? And let's see. So this is not good. I'm playing with the altitude right now. And it should be roughly like that. Right now, I should be more or less pointed to the sun. So let's have a look in the eyepiece to see if I am right. Okay, let's have a look. <laughs> it's there. I have some very minor adjustments to make. I'll go into speed maybe four. Yeah, so it's quite easy to do so. If it wasn't quite in the eyepiece, I would be like putting maybe a slew speed of six or seven. And while I look at the shadow and inside the eyepiece, I move it around, you know, until I find the sun in the middle. And that works shockingly well. It takes me maybe two, three minutes to find the sun using this, uh, this method. Now, the next step that, I, that we want to do is to actually focus the telescope and tune it. And focusing, it's like as usual, except that so for this particular telescope, it's like you have draw tubes like that that you need to extend. And then you have a helicoid or a helicoid, whatever, um, a thing that turns, that focuses. <laughs> so you have a, a focuser like that. Uh, if you have a refractor and you're using a quark eyepiece, it's your usual focus mechanism. Now to do that, that focusing, you typically want to have a very good view of the sun and to see the contrast, especially on the solar surface, if that's what you want to view an image. And for that, you have to accept, you'll have to look ridiculous. After all, we're trying to image or to view like rivers of plasma on our star and each of those rivers of, pl of plasma and eruptions and prominences they're several times the size of the earth like we're not joking around here so we can't afford to look a bit ridiculous anyone who complains the jokes on them and to look ridiculous i use a jacket and that jacket basically will be used to uh, block out all of the stray light from my surroundings uh, absolutely all of it from the ground from the fr and from the sun from behind me from that wall behind me that reflects the light and I just put it on, I look inside and then I focus and I make sure to block absolutely everywhere, right? So I, I kind of like wrap it around and then I look at the sun and I use the uh, focusing mechanism until I get perfect focus while looking at the details on the surface. If there are any, are the prominences, maybe at the edge of the sun. Uh, it might need to be done in like alternance with the tuning knob here, but I'll get back to that in a moment. And I am now in focus. And it's very useful to have this stupid looking jacket on top that you should really try for something that really filters out the light. So winter jacket works very well for me. Uh, not down jacket, down jackets there, they let the light through like crazy. Um, but you know, highly recommended. And the next step is to tune your, your solar telescope. If you have a quark eyepiece that you have, okay, so you have the normal refractor telescope. Uh, if it's small enough, you don't have an energy rejection filter at the front uh, in between the telescope and the, uh, your diagonal, which is a normal diagonal. You have a UV IR cut filter, a luminance filter. And then here you have your quark eyepiece. The quark eyepiece has a little tuning knob with, if I remember correctly, five different positions. And if you go from one position to the next, uh, it will use the power that it has from a little uh, USB power bank, for example, uh, to adjust the tuning, like the, the actual um, H alpha band pass kind of location using the, the heat, the temperature of the eyepiece. And it can take five to 10 to even 15 minutes to do that. There's an LED that turns green once it's done. And then you can check again and see like, okay, do I, see view, do I view more details or fewer details than I was able to before? Um, so it can be a bit frustrating because like 15 minutes earlier, did I really view as many details as I remember I did? No, uh -huh. it can take a, a bit of time, but once it's done, typically it works, it will work for most scenarios and the results are shockingly good. And you know, you could have an 80 millimeter refractor, a 100 millimeter refractor, and the results will likely blow you away. And now I heard that for quark, you typically want like something like uh, F7, like focal ratio of seven is probably the sweet spot, but F5, F10, they also work as far as I've, uh, I understand. My own telescope, the Sharp Star um, 107 pH that I had was F7. If I remember properly, it was an awesome telescope. I should never have sold it, uh, but anyway. 
next step so is tuning and for the quark eyepiece there's this uh, tuner for a dedicated solar telescope you might have one tuning tool like this one internally or maybe at the front of the telescope or you might have two i have a double stack telescope so which lets me see more details on the surface of the sun especially so because i can like make the band passes even like kind of tighter and so i have to use two tunings me mechanism one here which is mechanical and another here that's also mechanical and what i would typically need to do is and thank you for the comments helping me do that i would remove the front element of the telescope tune but while looking at the surface details or the prominence details without that uh, front element here uh, then once i'm done i replace the front element and i play with this ring here to get the better tuning and I've already done it, so I actually know where I am supposed to be. But here I am and I am tuned. There's one more thing, is the tilt mechanism on the front of this particular adapter. You want to make the tilt mechanism so that there is no solar reflections within the eyepiece. Oh man, and even without the sun, my sunshade, I have a beautiful view of the sun. Okay, and through the magic of editing, actually we are the day after and we are now in the morning. So yesterday I was mentioning how you can have all of that solar telescope or even a normal refracting telescope with a quark uh, chromosphere or quark, quark prominence, although I do recommend chromosphere, eyepiece added on top of it. And suddenly you have a whole new world that opens to you and it really is a whole new world and Seriously, if you get a quark eyepiece, unless you're going to get a defective one, which I really hope you don't, you will not regret it. Um, at any rate, it's the morning, so we should have better seeing. Also, my balcony wall here is actually um, letting me actually image, oops, although the top of my bald head is getting in the sun, so I'm going to protect that, is, is letting me image from the shade. <laughs> so that's a bit smarter, right? Lazier too, less sweaty, everything's better that way. And what I'm gonna do is I am going to use a camera that I bought specifically for solar astrophotography, but also works for planetary, as you may have seen from another video of mine uh, for Jupiter capture and processing, which I'm linking to above if you're interested. Uh, but it's the ASI 174mm and um, it is actually really excellent. Um, it is the only ASI camera that I am aware of that has a global shutter, meaning that instead of reading the image row per row, which if you have a target that's moving all around, like with wind uh, or poor tracking, that kind of stuff, that means that the target will be twisted around by the movement while the frame is being captured, which is something you do not want. If you have a global, global sh shutter, all of the pixels are read at once. So you're freezing the object into the frame when you're taking the picture. And so even if you have like a lot of movement, a lot of wind, your uh, picture has a much larger chance of being clear uh, because the only thing that will blur your picture is the exposure time. And the exposure time will be keeping it to a few milliseconds, ideally, as I've been told less than 10 milliseconds so i've already um plugged like you know my my telescope is already pointed to the sun i'm already tuned into the sun i see there's a pretty nice prominence that we have that i'm going to try to capture so i want to do two things capture one prominence if it's successful you'll see that prominence at the end of this video while we're doing it and i'm also going to try to take uh, solar surface details so for the prominence i think i'm going to go without any barlow lens i'm just going to put the camera plop it in there is this um, nose piece adapter there and we're going to plop the camera in and we're going to focus it so here we are we have our camera <laughs> um, uh, that is set up here. So the only time that I'll have to go into the sun will be for the focusing. I do not relish that part. Um, so I really want to get an autofocuser actually. That would be pretty cool, but that's a very expensive uh, proposition for this particular telescope. The uh, Solar Max 3, since it has a normal like kind of Crawford focuser, would be much easier to use in that regard. So we are plugging this in and I am going to uh, share my screen with you guys. Okay, so I've launched this software called uh, SharpCap and I'm just going to connect to the camera that appears in the camera list here. Um, and then we're going to see 
what happens. We'll want, okay, so we already see, let me remove my sunglasses, that's usually better to look at a computer screen, and we already see the sun, and it's a big white blob thingy here. I can ex adjust the exposure here, and I can adjust the gain of the camera as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to keep it fairly low, and I'm gonna see what kind of brings it into focus. So it's gonna be really hard. I hate that part. I wish I could do it from inside, but while I'm looking at my computer screen, Oh, now that's closer. So for me, I'm just pushing and pulling the draw tube and that gives me rough focus. So now we have rough focus. I am going to diminish to uh, lower the exposure time so we can actually see more of the details of the uh, solar surface. And by the way, when you look at the sun in H alpha, don't be fooled, the sun appears red. It's a beautiful red and this monochrome kind of thing does not do it justice. Um, Okay, so let me, uh, we're going to go to the center of the sun. And as was suggested to me in the comments, I will be um, using the auto histogram here of SharpCap, although there are other capture software like um, Fire Capture that also can do that to get a very high contrast image. And then I'm going to try to adjust the fine focus on that image. And this is really the most difficult part and if anyone has any tips and tricks about that let me know so i'm just turning my focuser and it feels like i'm trying to find like both sides of focus that's one side out of focus the other side out of focus and we have a cloud coming in <laughs> but that was dramatic wasn't it we i could have said it's a ufo the aliens are invading but no they're not it's just a cloud that's a bit disappointing uh, is the cloud still here? Come on, Mr. Cloud. Hey, Mr. Cloud. Um, yes, yes, good morning. Good morning to you too, sir. So we'll just wait a bit for that cloud to pass through. I hope it's not too extended. It's a beautiful um, cumulus, which means that if I were flying to the, on my paraglider, then I could just like go up and up and up with the energy of uh, heat and air currents and I think we're good <laughs> let's try this again so I'm going away from focus and back in focus and I'm trying to feel like the distance that I have between going again away from best focus and I think it's about here that we have best focus. And so this is what I'm gonna use for now. And I'm gonna re remove that histogram. And now we're gonna search for the prominence that I saw earlier, uh, visually on the scope, and see if we can find it. So for that, I'm going to uh, play with the gain and the exposure until, oh, well, I think that's it. <laughs> Here it is where we can actually see the uh, prominences throughout the sun. So I am actually just going to do a, a full oops, turn around the sun to find anything that looks interesting. So we have another one here that looks nice. I think the first one is more beautiful probably, but we can you know, try for both and see what we get out of this. There's a third one here. And this is, a, mind you, in the low period of activity of, uh, of the sun, which is pretty cool. So let's focus on this one for now. And I'm going to lower my gain again so that we get a fairly bright, but not too bright. So there's two schools of thought there for prominences. Either you take two images, one with the prominence is bright, the other where the, the prominence is... Uh, is dark and then this, the solar disk, it will be more visible and then you um, uh, basically compose both together. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is, I am going to just take um, a picture as mono 16, which means that I have a very high uh, bit 
depth. And this is what uh, some videos on YouTube from uh, Woodland Cameras, I think one of those uh, shops um, suggested, suggested. And for now, it has worked fairly well for me. So we're going to try that out right now. And so I'm going to go into Quick Capture and we're just going to capture that for 60 seconds. Note that I have a very low resolution of 640 per 480. That means I'm taking a small part of my sensor only. This is intentional. That way I will capture more frames. And so let's do a quick, ca quick capture. And that quick capture will do maybe 90 seconds. See what we get. And now we are capturing the sun. Okay, and we're done. So what we're gonna do now is search around on the surface of the sun for anything that looks interesting. And now again, we are in the solar minimum almost. So that means that we're not seeing a lot of surface uh, interesting features, but there's one here that I kind of like. There's something here that might be worth uh, capturing. And maybe here as well. Looks like something. It's a bit different than the rest of the pattern of the sun. Yeah, let's try to capture this body here. And for that, I'm going to use a Barlow lens because I really want to get into the details. Any Barlow lens will work. This is a Barlow lens that came with the solar telescope that's supposed to have special coatings for the solar wavelengths. Although, really? Uh, we're, gonna, we're just going to use it. Any Barlow lens really works. Which means that we need to do focus again. And I need to increase my gain and exposure time to get an actual a uh, bright image on here. And I think we're at good focus right now. So let's try to capture this. It looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, there's, there's like some weird surface feature there. I'm getting excited with this high contrast. Almost looks like, you know, hair on the surface of the sun, except that each of those hairs is bigger than, bigger than the earth. <laughs> oh man, it's such a fun thing to do and to attempt, you know. And we're done. So we've basically, during this video, what we've done is we've set up the actual solar telescope and you can use your own refracting telescope with a quark chromosphere to achieve the same kind of uh, results. We've tuned the telescope uh, solar etalons. We've reached best focus. With, we've observed the sun, of course, after actually slewing to the sun and using the shadow of the telescope to actually get the sun centered in the eyepiece if we don't have a solar finder. Then we went to um, actual image and I used the uh, ASI 174mm, which is again an amazing camera because it has a global shutter. And again, that's one of the things I leave a link, uh, affiliate link to OPT in the description down below. So if you're interested in buying this kind of equipment, so the 174mm or a solar telescope, but it's very expensive, or a quark chromosphere, which is also expensive, but it's much cheaper than a solar telescope and if you already have a refractor it can make it can give you absolutely amazing results feel free to go and uh, get that from the links uh, down below that will support me and the channel and otherwise you know we'll have the pictures at the end of the video uh, if you're interested in the processing process the processing process yeah why not the processing process that i have let me know down in the comments i could make a specific video about how to process those solar images using a free piece of software called the imppg which was recommended to me by several of the comments on my own channel so thank you so much i'm not an expert in solar but i really hope that this gives you like the the wish to have like a solar telescope whether it's white light or h alpha but i really recommend h alpha and you know it can really make things like make bad conditions be less bad because even, even if you have like large cloud cover at night even the sun is shining through the clouds for a few minutes you can grab a glimpse of it and it is magnificent it is beautiful it's ever-changing there's always more features you can catch and it's con constantly amazing i cannot you know get over how incredible it is and like pretty much every time i have my lunch break or that kind of stuff and since i'm working from home right now i like you know i get my lunch i come here and i observe the sun it's just too much fun 
And with that, uh, that's pretty much it for this video. So thank you so much for watching. Uh, stay tuned for the images at the end. If you are not subscribed to this channel, if you're new, welcome to the channel. Consider subscribing if this kind of video, usually about deep, deep, deep space astrophotography and astronomy, but you know, all kinds of topics around astronomy, astrophotography. If it interests you, feel free to go down below, click on the subscribe button, subscribe button the little notification bell. If you like the video, uh, please put a like in the comment uh, in down there below and please leave a comment as well if you have any tips and tricks or you know, you want me to do different kinds of videos or you have a video idea and you want to give me feedback back in general or you have an idea about like a patreon or uh, something like that i could do let me know down there and as always thank you so much for watching whenever you can don't forget to look up at the stars and i'll see you next time